Hey everybody, great to have you back to share time and God's Word together. And before I get started in the text, I just got to say I'm so encouraged by what God is doing in the church right now. Even though we're not able to get together with this crazy shutdown and our worlds are turned upside down, I am seeing and hearing evidence that more than ever before, we have a, a greater desire to serve one another, to have fellowship with one another, to do whatever it takes to strengthen one another, encourage one another. I'm, I'm seeing this, uh, and not just for one another in the church, but for the community, for our neighbors in our neighborhood. I, I don't have time to go over some of the awesome things that I've been hearing that's going on and and things that God's allowed me to be a part of during this time. But let's keep pressing on. We are the church. This is not the church. We are. We, those who follow Jesus Christ, those who believe in him as Lord and Savior, every believer, that is the church of God. And so we know that the church is much bigger than ourselves. It is the body of Christ. So let's be about serving the body of Christ and all to whom God would send us wherever we're at. Keep up the great work. Today I want to speak about what it means to be an intercessor. And great timing as we're talking about what God is doing right now. Part of what God is doing among us is that we're praying for each other more. And I want to talk about what it means to pray as a true intercessor. There are many reasons to intercede for one another. We intercede for people so that they would repent and be saved from their sin. We intercede for people so that they would be healed of their disease and of their sickness. We intercede so that others would be encouraged and strengthened through a difficult time. We, we pray that people would remain faithful through temptation. There are so many ways to intercede for one another. But no matter how it is that we are interceding, what, what the purpose, what, what the result we're seeking before the Lord, this is a common denominator, that when we engage in true intercession for others, we are imitating our Lord Jesus. We are being like Jesus, our eternal high priest, who always lives to make intercession for us. And that's the highest calling, to be like Christ. So that's what we're going to dive into right now. You want to take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 18. This is the account of Abraham praying that God would spare Sodom and Gomorrah. And prior to verse 16, which is where we're going to start reading, this is where the Lord appears to Abraham and tells him, renews his covenant, reminds him that Sarah is going to have a child, he's going to have Isaac, the, the son of promise, and that God is going to bless the nations through his seed, through Abraham and Sarah. And... There's this awesome time where the Lord encourages him. And then we're going, to, we're going to pick up verse 16 in this time of intercession. But before we do that, let's say a quick prayer. Father, I'm excited to hear your word. And that's what I'm praying for. Not that we hear the words that I have to say or the things that we want to hear said, but that we hear what your spirit says clearly from your word. We ask that you do this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, verse six, uh, chapter 18, verse 16 of Genesis. Then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I, was do what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, 
that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I, who am but dust and ashes, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be 40 found there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. This, what was Abraham thinking right now? It must have been such an amazing experience to be before the Lord. First of all, it says that Abraham looked up and there was three men. One of them we know was the Lord, revealed as the Lord Almighty, and there were two angels with him. Here, Abraham is before the Lord, and God grants every petition that he brings to him, every single request. God says, yes, Abraham. I will do that as well. Abraham must have been rejoicing at this point right now. What an awesome experience. And yet we know the end of the story. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Why? Because there were not even 10 righteous people in those wicked cities. Can you believe can you imagine how wicked it must have been? Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, let's look at verse 22. We're going to jump into this and see this intercession and learn from Abraham. Verse 22, then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Let's stop right there. Notice Abraham's posture. Okay, we're talking about an intercession. So what is our posture? How do we approach God? The first thing we hear from Abraham, of Abraham, is that he stood still before the Lord. Be still and know that I am God. You know, sometimes that's the hardest part of prayer for me. I want to just rush right into prayer, go right to the asking, right to the petition. God, I need this, I need this right now. And I forget to be still, to stand still before the presence of God. That is so important because that is where we empty ourselves. That is where we position ourselves, not only to speak to God, but to hear from God when he responds. Abraham fixed his attention on the Lord. And then we read, and Abraham came near and said, 
I believe there's a big difference between coming before the Lord and coming near the Lord. There's an incredible intimacy when we start to intercede, truly intercede for others. And it's, it happens when we draw near to God, not just crying out before him, God, I need you, or this person needs you, but we come, we stand still, we know that he's God, and then we draw near in humble yet bold steps, we draw near to God. This is, this is the posture we are to take. And Abraham, when he drew near to God and began to petition him, this is how he started off. He based his request on the very nature of God's holiness and justice. In other words, he addresses God, he addresses God based on the character of God. He speaks to the attributes of God. Listen to verse 25. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He is professing the very nature of God. Is he challenging God's credibility here? No, no, I don't believe that at all. Instead, he is speaking out loud his faith in who God is. God, you are a righteous God, and you would not slay the righteous with the wicked. You would not treat the righteous as you do the wicked. You are the judge of all the earth, and you have to do right. You know, it's said that we don't truly know what we believe until we hear it escape from our lips, until we speak it with our tongue. That's when we truly know out of the abundance of our heart what we really believe. And I believe this is what's happening here with Abraham. He is speaking to God, the very attribute to God, reminding himself, God must do right. Due to his immutable, unchangeable character, I am coming before God. I'm drawing near to the one who is righteous. And he will receive my request because of who he is. Very important when we come in intercessory prayer to speak the very nature of God, to proclaim his faithfulness. We are reminding ourselves, not God, reminding ourselves of who he is. If you're praying for someone to repent, if you are praying for someone to be saved from their sin, then come before God like this and proclaim this. 2 Peter 3, 9, Lord, I know that you are not slack concerning your promise, but you are long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is you, Lord. And I know that all things are possible to him who believes. You are speaking, you are professing the very nature of God, the very words of God, speaking them to God as you come to intercede. That's how we are to come before God in faith. Now let's look at Abraham's qualifications as an intercessor for a moment. He knew that he had favor with the Lord. When the Lord appeared to him with the two angels, Abraham worshipped him, worshipped him and said, If I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. And the Lord stayed. The Lord lingered there, proving to Abraham that he was in fact in God's favor. And God reaffirmed again. He reaffirmed his promise, his covenant with him. Abraham knew that he had found favor with God. So therefore, he knew that he was qualified by God's grace to come nearer to him. And we also know that Abraham was called the friend of God. Scripture tells us that he was the friend of God. What an amazing title. And we get bolder with our friends. We speak differently. We approach our friends differently than we approach others. Christian, we have found favor 
with God. If we're in Christ Jesus, we have favor with our Lord through the person of Jesus Christ. We are washed clean by his blood and brought into his grace as his children. And as we enter into that favor, we are, as his disciples were, called his friends. Listen to John 15, 13 through 15. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus spoke that to his disciples. And if you put faith in Jesus Christ, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Therefore, you have found favor with him. Therefore, you are a friend of God through Jesus. You are qualified. I am qualified if you are abiding in Christ to be an intercessor just as Abraham was. Abraham knew that he had favor, but that favor would be put to the test through an outpouring of intercessory prayer and faith as he cried out, as he persevered in faith, as he brings this request for Sodom and Gomorrah again and again. Look at verse 24. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Why does he start with 50 righteous? Why did Abraham pick 50 righteous? This is, these are two cities, mind you. Maybe he thought that that was too low to begin with, but risked it anyways. 50 people in the scope of two cities? Think about how wicked these cities were. Abraham must have been really cautiously approaching right now. What if there was 50? And he was so bold to start with 50. What a bold place to start. Praise God, Abraham wouldn't stop there. Verse 27. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I, who am but dust and ashes, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find there 45, I will not destroy it. He starts with 50, and the Lord says, Okay, Abraham, if I find 50 righteous souls there, I will spare the cities. And so when Abraham receives that answer, he lingers. He's still before the presence of the Lord. He draws nearer. He says, Lord, what if there's five less than 50? And God says, I will not destroy it if there are 45. I love how plainly this passage is an example of how intercessory prayer is a back and forth conversation with God. It is a call and response. It's not an oratory. It's not a speech. Intercession is not a soliloquy where we just talk to God. God, I want you to do this for me because of this and this and this and this and this, and we stop. No, it's a conversation. Do you believe that prayer is a conversation? If you don't, you've missed what prayer is entirely. This is God wanting to communicate with us, not just hear from us, but speak to his children. It is the call and response. It is a conversation with the Lord Almighty that somehow places us on an even playing field. Now, by that, I don't mean by any means that we have the same glory or we have an even playing field of power with God, not at all. But God, in his infinite grace and mercy, has removed the barrier between God and man. And now we can come straight to God in the person of Jesus Christ, our high priest, as his children. We can approach our Father 
before the throne of grace. He has even the plain field in that we come straight to him through his son, Jesus Christ, the mediator, the God-man. Amazing. Well, Abraham, having been granted his request, and again, his second request is suddenly not satisfied with that. And he lingers a little longer. Suppose there should be 40 found there. So God said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. What is happening here? Abraham is getting bolder as he continues to intercede for others. Hear that. Abraham grew bolder the more he engaged in intercessory prayer. I see this applying to the moment, to this, this specific moment, and as he stands before God, just like it will, it will apply to any specific moment when we intercede for someone, the more we ask in true faith before God, claiming his promise, proclaiming his attributes of justice and righteousness and holiness, the more we ask in that moment, the more bold we will get to keep asking more boldly. But I believe this truth also applies to our lifetime, to our journey of faith. The more we intercede for others, the more we will want to intercede for others throughout our life. We will become more bold in our journey of faith to cry out for one another that God would do wonders, that God would heal, that God would save, that God would redeem, restore, strengthen. Don't you want to be growing in your faith? It starts with this kind of faith coming before him, drawing near, and then persevering. Be more and more bold in his presence as his child. Scripture tells us, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, as he grows more and more bold, we come to verse 31, and this is the title of our message today. Indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Abraham is so engaged right now in what he is doing, and he's so encouraged that God has granted his request, and God is saying, keep asking. Keep asking, Abraham. And he says, indeed, now, in this moment, I have taken it upon myself with boldness to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20, he, he's probably shaking in this moment, so pro, suppose 20 be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Wow. It's all or nothing faith that he is showing here. The awe and the reverence in his words as he says, indeed, now I've taken it upon myself. What an amazing moment for him. He's coming in fear, but in true boldness before the creator of the universe. Do we know what it is to enter this realm of faith? Remember, Christian, God has promised us his spirit without measure. God gives to us, Scripture tells us, his spirit without measure. That means he doesn't give us just a little bit of his spirit. When a soul enters into the kingdom of God by faith, by repenting from sin and believing in Jesus Christ, and choosing to follow him, in that moment, they are given the Spirit of God without measure, the fullness of God's Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that soul. We are given the Spirit without measure. Don't forget that. But faith is given by measure. We talked about this several Sundays ago. Faith can increase. The Spirit of God is given without measure. But each one has a measure of faith, and that faith can grow. That faith is meant to grow, even though we have the power of the risen Lord in us, 
There are things that we do not claim because we don't have the faith to claim it. And so God says, let it be according to you. Unto you, let it be according to your faith. How many times do we read that in Jesus as he healed people, as he delivered people? Let it be according to your faith. Indeed, now, in this moment, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Verse 32, <clears throat> then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. And every time I read this, I, I come on, keep going. But Abraham stops at 10. Why but once more, Abraham? Now, I can say that, and I don't say that in a way of rebuke or to talk bad about Abraham because what an amazing man of faith Abraham was. Would I have even started with 50 and, and let alone gone less than 50? I am not bad-mouthing Abraham, but Abraham, to be so bold, to go all the way down to 10? Why did you speak once more? Why did you not go again and say, Lord, would you spare it for only one? One righteous soul. What would have happened if Abraham went less than 10? Every single request that he asked, God granted. So why not ask for more? He had already had favor in God's eyes. That was, was beyond doubt here. And here he is speaking with God face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. Incredible. Why stop at 10? This is a call, Christian, to be not just like Abraham, but even more, to be like Peter. And what I mean by that is this. Peter walked on the water. Why? Why is it that Peter walked on the water? It's because Jesus told him to walk on the water? Was it Jesus' idea? No. It was Peter's idea. If you remember that account, Jesus is, is walking on the water. Here, here are the disciples in the boat. It's tossed back and forth. What a frightful moment in the middle of the storm in the darkness. And here they look out and they see Jesus. They think it's a ghost. But Peter says, Jesus, if that's you, call me out to you. Command me that I come out to you on the water. Tell me to walk on the water. It was Peter's idea to walk on the water, not Jesus. And Jesus said, okay, Peter, come and walk on the water. And Peter walked on the water because he was bold enough in his faith, knowing who his Lord was, that if it really was Jesus, then I could walk on water. That's the kind of faith we need as intercessors. Now, Peter walked a little bit and then he took his eyes off Jesus and he started to sink. We can't give up. We have to persevere in our faith. But true intercessory pray, faith, the way that God wants us to pray, says, get out of the boat. Ask Ask me to have you walk on water, and you will. Well, we've spent the bulk of our time talking about Abraham as an intercessor, but I want to end with speaking of the ultimate intercessor, Jesus Christ. So, two verses. Bear with me as we wrap this up. Isaiah 53, 12, and Hebrews 7, 25. Isaiah 53, 12 reads... Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Four things here. He poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. Let's apply that to us now. We need to pour out our soul 
for the one that we are interceding for. Even unto death, meaning die to self, die to our needs. We need to put this one that we're praying for, put their needs before our own right now as we intercede, as we pour out our soul, crying out to God for them. Number two, as Jesus was numbered with the transgressors, so we need to number or associate ourselves with the one we're praying for. We need to have an empathy. We need to enter in and associate, reckon ourselves with them as if it was our own personal need, which leads us into the third thing. He bore the sin of many. We need to bear their burdens as we intercede. Now, of course, we cannot bear their sin, their burden, like Christ bore our burdens on the cross, but we can hurt with their hurt. We can have sorrow because of the sorrow they're suffering from. We need to bear one another's burdens. And this last one, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Now that word intercession in the Hebrew means to meet or encounter someone or to reach for someone. There on the cross, he met us. He reached for the transgressors. We need to reach on behalf of one another when we intercede as Christ reached for us, bridging the gap. What a powerful passage that teaches us how to be a true intercessor. And just one more, Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. He, uh, Isaiah 53, 12 told us how Christ interceded for us through his death. And here it tells us how he intercedes for us by his life. How he lives always to make intercession for us. And the word intercession here in the Greek text means to obtain by hitting the mark. And I read that and I thought, hitting the mark, that sounds very familiar. Where have I heard that before? That's the word sin in the Greek, hamartia, which means to miss the mark. When we sin, we miss the mark of God's righteousness, of God's holiness. But this word intercession is the antonym to sin. It means to obtain by hitting the mark. Sin means to miss the mark and to intercede is to hit the mark. Jesus lives, always lives, to hit the mark for us, to reverse the curse of sin. When we miss the mark through our sin, Jesus interceded and hit the mark. And so when we, when we intercede for one another, we are praying that God brings us to the point where we are praying in, in perfect line with his will to hit the mark of his will for one another. Oh, I'm so encouraged by that. To intercede, to hit the mark for one another. Of course, only Jesus could hit the mark that we missed. Our sin could never be paid for anything that we do or anyone else does for us. Only Jesus Christ. But 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We're ambassadors for Christ as though Christ was, were pleading through us. When we intercede for one another, Christ is interceding, is pleading through us. This is so important. Are you interceding for one another? I know the church is doing that. I, I've seen it. I've experienced people praying for me, telling me they're praying for me. God's stirring my heart to pray for you. This is it. Have you taken it upon yourself to speak to the Lord? As Abraham said, now I've taken it upon myself. I'm going to be bold and I'm going to ask for more. In Jesus' name, are you being bold in your intercessory prayer? The Lord is going to reward you greatly 
the Lord is going to reward me greatly. The more bold we become in our faith, he wants to answer our prayers. And he's saying, get out of the boat. Ask and you will receive. Last verse. 1 John 5, 14 through 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Whatever we ask, we know that he hears us and that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. That is what it means to be an intercessor. Lord bless you. Hope to see you again next week. Hope to see you here in church, but I don't see that happening unless the Lord makes something change real fast here. Either way, be with the Lord this week, praying for one another, being grounded in his word. Approach him as his word tells us to approach him claiming his promises for one another.